Morning Talk with Sikkim Gabadeli. Sikkim Gabadeli. And it's six minutes past nine. You're listening to SAFM, South Africa's news and information leader. We have a big continental start on the program this morning. We're going to start with our neighbor Zimbabwe. They're marking 32 years of independence this year. But what has the country got to show for itself today? And it continues to struggle with deep poverty and political instability. The global political agreement is said to be limping along at best or dead in the water at worst. So this morning we want to hear what you make of the current state of our northern neighbor Zimbabwe. I'll take your calls on 0891104207, SMS is 34701. After 10, Brian Hirsch is going to deal with some frequently asked questions about personal finance. Then Dinoa is going to focus on the new Municipal Property Rates Act and we will wrap with a look at diplomatic relations between South Africa and Nigeria. Is it a case of two bulls in a crawl uh, battling it out for economic and political dominance on the African and global stage. So we'll talk about that after 11. That's the program. Call us 0891104207. Send us an SMS to 34701. Those are charged at two rand. Email us at morning at safm.co.za. When it comes to insight into technology and how to innovatively connect with the people of Gauteng, the Gauteng Provincial Government is paving the way. On the 14th of June, the Gauteng ICT Summit 2012 will bring together over 500 government and non-governmental organization and ICT specialists as they discuss sustainable ICT infrastructures and new ways of delivering service uh, to the public. For more information, visit www.gautengonline.gov.za or call 011-689-8002. This message is brought to you by the Gauteng Provincial Government in association with Telcom Business, SMMT, SAP, Microsoft and Dell. Morning Talk with Sikim Gabadeli. Sikim Gabadeli. 10 minutes past nine, talking about Zimbabwe 32 years after independence. And interesting, lots of different views on this one. I'm going to read you two, and uh, then we're going to chat to my guest, um, Admor Chuma, who's a PhD researcher and international commentator on Southern African issues. And I'll take your calls as well on 0891104207, SMSs to 34701. So here's one uh, Facebook comment uh, from Dumelo Mate who says, I am a proud Zimbabwean Siki, and in the 32 years of Zimbabwe's sovereign rule, I can comfortably and without fear declare that we are free in all aspects and spheres. It's only the sanctions imposed by the Western countries that seem to be making my country to be viewed in a negative way. One thing for sure is that Zim citizens are hard workers, and this was instilled in us by our forefathers. It is a matter of time before Zimbabwe emerges to be the breadbasket and economic hub of the world. And uh, here's a Another comment from Abu Weng who says, Siki, as bad as it is for the Zim people, how do we put our hands in our faces blocking what we don't want to see? We comment and laugh about Mugabe and his comrades, some of the participants contributing to your topic at the comfort zones of their warm, heated homes, forgetting that we still have unfulfilled promises with our people still in shacks as we speak. All the government ever does is sweep away the eyes of the public and the world cannot see. That's a comment from Abu Wang. So, interesting, different uh, views on that one. We'll read more, but I want to hear from you as well this morning. But first, let's say good morning to Admor Chuma, PhD researcher and international commentator on Southern African issues. Admor, thank you very much for your time this morning. Hello, good morning, Sege. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? I'm well, thank you as well. I'm South Africa this morning. It is freezing cold. You don't want to be here. <laughs> oh, my God. You oh. don't want to be <laughs> well, here. Well, I've acclimatized uh, here in England. It's a bit... Um uh, lousy, really. Uh, I suspect uh, it's we're warmer. We're in summer right now, actually. <laughs> I suspect it's much warmer than Johannesburg. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. I wish I was in Johannesburg anyway, because mm. I'm no longer used to this uh, warm weather, really. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about, uh, talk about Zimbabwe. I've just read two um, different comments on the yep. situation there. Uh, so what do you make of, of Zimbabwe at the moment? Um, the... The problem about Zimbabwe, to be honest, the way I feel, if you look at Zimbabwe from 1980, when we became independent from Rhodesia, the situation, the political, civil, cultural rights, socioeconomic inequalities actually 
a betrayal of the struggle against the colonialism. And worse more, I believe it, is, it actually betrays the very spirit of uh, the capability of black people as managers, as economic managers. Mm. We inherited one of the world's best organized economy, which was Rhodesian economy anyway. But right now, the economy has melted down unprecedentedly. And um, almost half of the population in Zimbabwe, according to the United Nations, face starvation, live in absolute poverty. Nearly 2 million Zimbabweans live in South Africa, which is unprecedented. There is even a school of thought which says the xenophobia that hit South Africa in the last three or four years was actually triggered off by the Zimbabwean population which is in, in South Africa. But what I'm trying to say is that um, we as black independent post-colonial Rhodesia, post-colonial Zimbabwe, we have failed our own people, we have betrayed our own people, we have betrayed the very principles of being independent. In your view, Admore, where do you think things started to go wrong? Because the popular narrative is that it all started with the land invasions in 2000. But if one goes back to the 80s and looks at the attacks and the massacre in Matabele land, the roots lie deeper than that. Yes, that's the thing about Zimbabwe. When you want to look at the problem Zimbabwe is facing at the moment, we can, defy, we can analyze Zimbabwean problems in three sections. We can, of course, use the approach of saying Kukura Hundi in the 1980s and land reform program, which was unworkable. And then the MDC from 1999 up to now, whereby we witnessed serious violations of human rights. We witnessed torture, abuses, and so on. We go back again to the Kukura Hundi era when Mugabe became the first leader of Zimbabwe in 1980. We realized that 20,000 Ndebele speaking people were massacred, were butchered by the 5th Brigade, which was the violation of the international law. It was actually the violation of the Geneva Convention Additional Protocol of 1973, which states clearly that uh, if you are ahead of a state and then send an army to a particular troubled area, and that army happens to target civilians, Therefore, you have committed war crimes. You should be prosecuted. You are a criminal. This is what happened, actually, in the 1980s. From that time, it, uh, this transcended into our present problems in the economics, which is now melting down. And you go down again to the land reform program. If you look at the land reform program, we are told by the Mugabe regime that um, over 300,000 people by 2003 were actually resettled. But at the same time, again, a parliamentary report stated clearly that most of the suffering poor Zimbabweans never benefited from the fatal land. The land was actually divided, distributed within Mkabe's elites, which is seriously problematic. Now, you have if you those... look at the whole land reform yeah. program, it was chaotic, it was haphazard, it was done to score a politically a skewed political ideology. But there are those who say that the land reform program was a success. Zimbabwe has now taken the land back without compensation. It's been given back to the rightful owners, and this sets it up for a better economic future going forward. That view is seriously problematic because um, why is it that we don't have food? Why is it that a very rich country like Zimbabwe is pleading for food in Zambia? is pleading for food in South Africa. Why is it that all Zimbabwe, basically up to 4 million Zimbabweans are outside the country? They are putting if that we have on the... food, yeah. we will be feeding ourselves. We, would, we wouldn't be. Just in the last two months, yeah. Zimbabwe was in Zambia asking for food. This actually demonstrates that uh, the land reform program was distributed uh, in a very confusing manner, which it was not in the best interest of Zimbabweans. But so those who are proponents of the current Zimbabwe would say that it's due to the sanctions against um, some of its leaders. 
That's the other thing, again, which uh, I think the regime in Zimbabwe has managed to brainwash Africa, if not uh, uh, the whole world. The sanctions are not proper sanctions. They are targeted sanctions. There are no sanctions against Zimbabwe. The only sanctions which are there, they are, sanctions, they are travel sanctions targeted against Mugabe's cronies. I mean, uh, what I'm trying to say is that uh, there is a lot of trade between the United Kingdom, between the West and Zimbabwe. There are no sanctions against Zimbabwe. The sanctions are targeted sanctions. And and that that being the, the counter-argument, of course, that the only people affected by the sanctions are specific ZANU-PF uh, political leaders and not necessarily the whole country. But let's talk about that. Let's talk about the political front then at the moment. Uh, we're still waiting for the constitutional process to be completed. It seems to be stalled. Meanwhile, uh, President Mugabe has been calling for elections to be fast-tracked. But if you look at the current situation, are the conditions conducive for even a roadmap to elections to be drafted? I don't think really Zimbabwe is ready for any credible elections at the moment. What should happen is that uh, Zimbabwe must fulfill the GNU agreement first so that we are able to have credible elections. Besides that, we don't want to go back into what happened in 2008. That was really a sham for Africa, not only for Zimbabwe alone. We... The, the, the very ideology of ZANU-PF is to push forward for elections without any demarcations in order to perpetrate violence, in order to force Zimbabweans to vote for them as they normally do. The implementation of that GNU agreement, of course, as we know, has been very problematic. Let's talk about the role of SADC. There have been a number of SADC summits where the Zimbabwean crisis has been on the agenda, and yet we haven't seen any movement towards a solution there. So what role do you think SADC should be playing here? To be honest, personally speaking, I'm so much disappointed by SADC. The way SADC has, the role SADC has played in what is happening in Zimbabwe at the moment. SADC has failed the Zimbabweans in terms of that they are kind of showing this idea of being scared of Robert Mugabe. For example, I'm a little bit impressed by President Zuma. President Zuma has shown a different stance, a different framework from what uh, the former South African president, Beggy, used to do. Um, what SADC needs to do is to go to Robert Mugabe and tell him that uh, we want this A, B, C, D to be implemented before any election talk. Otherwise, if they don't do that, mm. this is when we experience situations of the Western world coming to Zimbabwe to say we cannot allow this to go on. Because I know, you know that um, the modern world is a global village whereby yeah. there is global justice, whereby all human rights are indivisible, interdependent, and interrelated. If somebody dies, is tortured in Zimbabwe, it affects everybody around the world. But the thing is, what we have seen in post-colonial Africa, when they get some interference from outside uh, Africa, they start to talk about, oh my God, these people are coming to recolonize us, mm. brainwashing young people, which is not true, really. But coming back then to uh, SADC and, and the role of the mediators, I mean, we've seen uh, ZANU-PF playing stalling tactics at, at SADC and criticizing South Africa, criticizing President Zuma and criticizing his international advisor, Lindy Wazulu. So what, what, is the, what is the way out here? If we're going to keep having SADC summits where things are left to the next one and to the next one, we could be having this conversation at more in 10 years' time. Uh, what we needed to do, um, of course, um, the criticism on Zuma is because Zuma has really shown a different approach from uh, Mbeki, from Tabo Mbeki, because uh, Mugabe is one person who believes that whatever wrong he does, because he is a former freedom fighter, so all post-colonial political leaders have got to support him. But the, the thing is, by South Africa's stance, it, 
it is much more helpful and i personally believe that south africa has got to maintain its stance and say we got to stick to the textbook knowledge to what we agreed on Mm. And where do you think the difference between um, the Zuma administration's uh, mediation is to that of the Mbembeke administration? What's the key difference? Um, The Zuma administration, to be honest with you, I've done a lot of research. I've been to South Africa uh, in the last two years doing a research on the Truth and Reconciliation Commission Mm. and also doing the... Uh, looking at the the alien tort, the apartheid victims suing multinationals in the United States. It is the Zuma government which has supported apartheid victims. That's the first time in South Africa to happen. And it is the first time for the Zuma government again to say, we are taking a different stance from Tabombeki. We want Robert Mugabe to do the right thing, not to do as he wants. Because the truth is, if South Africa does not stand up against Robert Mugabe, the, I mean, the economy of South Africa will suffer. We will begin to experience more xenophobic attacks in South Africa. We begin to see all social ills in South Africa. Not only in South Africa, this will create a chain reaction mm. around SADC, if not in the entire African continent. Because uh, if... If Mugabe is allowed, really, look here, Sigi, mm. we are talking about a country that was feeding Southern Africa at one point. Yeah. If this country is destabilized by a screwed up leader, if this leader is not contained, this will affect Southern African economy. But Zonabi, if we told, has bright, has capable, has enthusiastic members who don't agree with the direction that the party has taken and the direction of the country, why are they not able to step up to the plate and ask President Robert Mugabe to step down? Um, I think... The way in which Zanopi of Zimbabwean politics has been constructed detects that Robert Mugabe is on top there. There was an article in the uh, state media in the last two days Mm -hmm. whereby the first lady came out for the first time saying she is the only person who talks to Robert Mugabe. I found that extremely disturbing. Mm To me, it was an acceptance by the First Lady that um, President Mugabe is inaccessible. President Mugabe is powerful than Zimbabwe itself. This is because uh, Robert Mugabe has actually portrayed himself as the only person in Zimbabwe who is fit to lead that beautiful country. All right, let's take some calls then add more. Let's hear from Aloysius calling us from Japan. Hi, Aloysius. Uh, good morning, Siki. Morning to your guests and to your listeners as well. Mm. Yeah, um, I think your guest is uh, one of those Africans who are taking daily bread from the West in order to criticize the good works in Africa and to protect the Western interests. Um, your guest talked about the, mata- the massacre in Matabere land. Um, why was it that the West were not interested when that massacre happened? Uh, probably because that massacre had to do with black people and black people alone. They were not interested because uh, it did not impinge on them. Uh, secondly, uh, your guest, uh, which uh, Zimbabwe once was once, mm. and the food basket of Africa, which Zimbabwe once was under the same uh, administration of uh, President Robert Mugabe. Now, um, Robert Mugabe is one of those Africans who have done something that no African leader has ever done (laughs) by trying to uh, recover, not only recover, to restore the African dignity and to restore hope for the future of Zimbabweans, for the future generations of Zimbabweans. Now, the the, the present generation of Zimbabweans only want to be, you know, uh, be under the white supremacy of the few minority of white Zimbabweans who have occupied the land that belongs to Africa. What would Mugabe have done to have uh, earned a very good name for himself? Only if he had left the few whites uh, yeah. to have earned and occupied the land as they did. All right. Yeah. Thanks. Oh, sorry, Aloysius. Sorry, I didn't mean to do that. I really didn't. Respond Charles in Cape Town. Um, I'll give you a chance, at more. Let's just take, we'll take two more calls. Okay. And then uh, we'll go to headlines, and then I'll give you a chance to respond. So just make some notes. Charles okay. in Cape Town, morning. Morning, Siki, and then your guests. Um, 
So, yeah, just want to, 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 to the, the reason with this, um, your, your guest speaker here. Um, he's saying that he's going back to the 1980s, Matabili, massacre, so-called massacre. I mean, if you look at our history, that means that he's, he's implying that the clerk, uh, he needs to be, be charged for crimes for the massacres of June the 76th, the Mtata PSC student massacres, and then the Boy Patong massacres. The other point is the farms, the, the, the invasions, there has been, I mean, it's been reported by British um, reporters that the farms that was given to, to the, the small farmers, they success. I mean, they, they have been, um, I mean, they, they're actually producing um, food for the, for the community. The other thing he speaks about, the destabilization of oh, Mr. Mugabe. I mean, if he had destabilized South Africa or the other regions, I mean, why is he still in power? It means that the people, there is support. I mean, how can you still be in power and there is not support base? So naturally, I think, and the other the point is, um, there has so, been so the right, times you... report yeah. on the economic recovery of, of the, the Zimbabwe economy. And it, I mean, yeah. they're actually calling for South African investors. If they don't come to the party, they will lose out for investing in Zimbabwe. So, so I'm not mm, sure um, yeah. where this gentleman, I mean, he, 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 he is... He's not giving the true story. I All mean, right. our media also always placing Zimbabwe's down the, 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 the... I mean, it's it's a rich rock bottom. But I mean, mm. the, if you go to Zimbabwe and report from Zimbabwe, you actually can, you know, be an investor there. I let mean, me, let me ask, you, let me ask you this. Basically, well, what they're feeling. Yeah, well, let me ask you this. You said that, uh, you know, obviously Mugabe still has a support. Why else would he uh, be in power? So you don't believe the reports that he rigged an election in 2008 and that he actually intimidated and people were no, beaten no, no, up no, and tortured? That, that, that uh, has been, there, there, was, there was claims of that there, and there was reports of that. But, um, Siki, mm. how can you say the whole elections? I mean, uh, we had, um, you know, uh, what you call it, people there to witness. I mean, there was, cla- I mean, there w- it was claims, but it, it couldn't claim that the whole, the whole election was uh, was a farce. All right, I'll so hear what Admiral has to say. Is, is the point. Uh, yeah. All right, I'll hear, I'll hear what Admiral has to say. Let me just take one more call from Mike and Newlands, and then we'll go to headlines. Hi, Mike. Hi, good morning, Siggy. Morning. Uh, yeah, a couple of things. Look, uh, the, some of the farms are working, but only at about 20% capacity. I just uh, was in Zimbabwe recently. Um, I saw a gentleman on the side of the road, and he looked quite healthy. Five days later, when I came past, he died from starvation. The the election that they had up there, um, well, they, yes, they certainly had an election, and they didn't rig the whole thing, but they rigged enough of it to crook it. If you remember, it took something like about four weeks for the results to yeah. come out, so they were so busy crooking them. The final thing I just wanted to make a comment on is that that what worries me about Zimbabwe, and I think for me it's, it's, it's a mirror of the country that we're in. If you look historically at Zimbabwe, when, when things were going well, in fact, their, their dollar was stronger than our rand. I remember very well Mugabe standing up in Parliament querying one of the acts, and one of it was something to do with the, with the, uh, with the crush, um, stopping the information getting through because uh, Zimbabwe, for some strange reason, we think it's because Mugabe had some interest in some mines, had sent troops which was not constitutionally allowed into, uh, I think it was then the Belgian Congo or the Congo. Uh, it had to be passed through Parliament to allow this, so it was quickly done, uh, voted against, and mm. it still went through. And I remember that very well, and I think that is where we are in this country at the moment with the secrecy build. And it, 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 to me, it's a reflection of where we're going to go. And if you want to see South Africa in 40 years' time, look, some people like it, and we know the ANC uh, youth league thinks Zimbabwe is a great success story. But uh, if anybody's been there recently and looked at the staff and unemployment up there, um, well, uh, you know, it just, it just beggars belief that people can even think that that government is even slightly legitimate. All right. so Thanks, thank you. Mike. All right, Admiral, I'll give you a chance to respond. It's 26 minutes at 2.10 in conversation with Admiral Chuma, PhD researcher and international commentator on Southern African issues, talking about 32 years since Zimbabwe's independence. Let me, let me read some SMSs. And then we'll give uh, Admiral a chance to respond to the issues raised, and then we'll take more calls. So Eddie says, no, Siki, Zimbabwe only had independence since circa year 2000. South Africa is still waiting. Paul says, more than half of Zim is in South Africa already, so I feel we should get rid of that full running the country and just lay claim to Zim and make it part of South Africa. Charles in Durban says, have the... 
Zimbabweans have the government they deserve. One party states serve only those in power. Learn from this South Africa. Strong opposition is vital. Uh, someone says, I am Zimbabwean. Truly, there's nothing to show in my country except potholes, burst surges, uh, looting by ZANU PF, and torture. Ntlantla says, Zimbabwe was coming along well. All it lacked really is that it never had a Puluguane moment. I believe she will rise again. And someone says, a contestant in Big Brother Africa said, There's no freedom of speech. In Zimbabwe. Is this true? And Konzi says, at least Zimbabweans have the real freedom, unlike South Africa where we have paper freedom. Europeans still running, uh, still ruling uh, South Africa. God bless Zimbabwe. One day is one day. All right. Interesting uh, comments. I'm um, add more. I think maybe let's uh, start with the callers and we'll get to uh, the SMSs. So Alois is saying that, you know, you're citing uh, the Kukura Hundi, but the West did nothing about it. But again, um, this is not justification for Mugabe to kill his own black people. If the West really didn't care about um, the Bele people being murdered by Robert Mugabe, it does not mean that it's less of a crime. Actually, that on its own makes him to be a bad leader. I'm actually very disappointed by this, uh, by your caller from Japan, who happens to be an African. He, to me, really, I feel burdened by his lack of knowledge, by his lack of information in Zimbabwe. He thinks that Robert Mugabe has made a good name. Oh, oh my God, I wish he was Zimbabwean himself. I mean, for a normal person to think that Robert Mugabe is a good leader, when nearly half of the population of that particular country uh, has left the country, when the banks are running out of local and foreign currency, where in the world have you ever heard of a country actually discontinuing its own currency? There's, there's no Zimbabwe dollar anymore. Why is it so? What this caller has to know is that uh, human rights is, are intertwined with the performance of the economy. But the point, it, listen to this, the point that he's making, and it's the point that those who support uh, Robert Mugabe will also make, is that what Mugabe did was to restore the land back to his rightful owners, and what he's done is what no other African leader has done, and that's to restore African it, dignity and its future. And he's being, now I just want to finish the point, that yeah. he is being being demonized for that. And that, I think, is the point that Aloysius was making. Again, it's lack of information. The reason why Robert Mugabe launched the land reform program, it's because some Western leaders, particularly Tony Blair, the British Prime Minister then, actually told Robert Mugabe that he has overstayed in power in 1997. Then Robert Mugabe attained. It was actually a way of spiting the British, because uh, the, Tony Blair had actually insisted that uh, his overstaying in power was not good for democracy. Look here, the idea of going into war against the, the racist Rhodesian government was to get our land back, was to correct the injustices of the colonial era. Get me right, mm. the land reform is on its own a fantastic program. But the way Zano PF, Robert Mugabe, executed it, it was done for, person, for personal political ideologies. I mean, to score personal political gains. So I'm not saying that Robert Mugabe mm -hmm. was wrong by redistributing land, because the question of land is a question that all of us have to visit at some point. But what I'm saying, the way Robert Mugabe executed the land reform program, it was not an honest idea. In 1980, let me explain further, I mean, to your caller, to your first caller, actually. Mm -hmm. There was... Joshua Nkomo, who was the first founder of Zimbabwe's liberation struggle. He was the leader of ZAPU, ZAPU, which was actually the first political, revolutionary political party in Rhodesia in the 1960s. Now, when we became independent in 1980, Joshua Nkomo said, OK, we are now independent. Let's forget about the Lancaster House Agreement. Let's launch the land reform program as soon as 1980-81. Mm. Robert Mkabe said no, because he was the friend of the West. 
Now, in 1997, the British turned that against him, and then he spited them by launching the loan reform program. That is why it was as bloody as it was, as haphazard as, as it was. Your caller needs really to understand Zimbabwean history before commenting about it. And the question on, the, on freedom of speech in Zimbabwe? Um, well, that is a well-known thing around the world. How many Zimbabwean journalists have been arrested for writing stories and criticizing Robert Mugabe? How many Zimbabwean journalists, the parade editor, the late Mark Chavunduka, was arrested and tortured for publishing a story about Robert Mugabe's marriage to Grace Mugabe, which was then a secret? It turned out to be true true that uh, Robert Mugabe had indeed married Chris Mugabe. But would you say such a country indeed has some freedom of speech? And would you call such a government, such a leader, a good leader? We'll take calls, Naeem. Yeah, Naeem, I'll take, I'll take some calls in a moment. You know, add more and I'll give you a chance to respond. There's more SMSs as well and Facebook messages. Naeem, Zwandiland, Victor, I'll come to you in a moment. Morning Talk with Sikim Gabadeli. Sikim Gabadeli. It's 18 minutes at 2.10. Let's take some calls. Naeem and Alberton, good morning. Uh, hello, good morning. Hi. Greetings to you and your guest. Mm. Uh, three aspects. Good morning. Uh, firstly, uh, the Matabili Land Massacre. It, isn't it quite ironic that uh, a couple of years after that, Britain actually gave uh, Robert Mugabe a knighthood? So not only did they not weren't they bothered about it, but uh, maybe it enhanced his credentials in the eyes. Uh, second point, uh, yes, uh, it is possible that uh, Mugabe did the land grab to spite uh, uh, Britain because Britain reneged on its agreement, uh, the Lancaster House Agreement. But then in consequence to that, uh, Britain and the West actually actively sabotaged uh, the Zimbabwean economy. So the sorry state Zimbabwe finds itself in is not only due to m- uh, misadministration of which mm. there may be, it, that may be possible or any other factors. There are many other factors also, p- perhaps drought and so forth. But uh, p- uh, a crucial factor would be the uh, economic sabotage. And uh, I'd like your guests to refer to uh, the sanctions. It's an Orwellian-sounding name. I think it's a Free Zimbabwe Act or something like that. Uh, there's about uh, six clauses. And the last two clauses specifically targets any business, any company that uh, does trade with Zimbabwe. So it doesn't only target the, 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 the top leadership. It targets, it's, it's similar to what the, they're doing with Iran now. Any company uh, that does business with uh, Zimbabwe uh, uh, will, uh, won't be able to do business with America or American companies, something, something along those lines. So it, it, it actually sabotages, it sabotages the, the whole economy. Uh, final point, uh, isn't it strange how some elections are you know, freer than others or more corrupt than others? Some elections that are even more corrupt and more rigged than Zimbabwe are, are legitimized by the West. You know, uh, Afghanistan, uh, uh, Uganda, Nigeria, uh, Kenya even. Uh, but the, those are acceptable. And Zimbabwe, where there may have been uh, uh, rigging, perhaps less than in, in those countries, but the, they, they you demand a very high standard. It must be absolutely you, you know, uh, without any uh, misdemeanor, if, even the, the present, uh, you know, Palestine, Egypt, all of those elections also. Yeah. So, so really there's, you know, different strokes for different folks, different laws for different countries. All right. And I find that highly problematic. Thanks, Naeem. Um, Zwandile in Johannesburg. Morning. Morning, Sigiyo. I'm well, thanks. I'm um, okay. I think uh, Naeem has said a lot, and there's something that was said by the gentleman. In as much as we all agree that uh, there are problems in Zimbabwe, there's no freedom of speech and stuff like that. But we also need to look at where they are and where we are. Economically, we, are, we can say we are doing better than them. But if you look at it, we have always had a lot of Zimbabweans, even during the apartheid time, even when Zimbabwe was called the, the, the basket uh, uh, of, 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 of Africa, we've always had Zimbabweans working in South Africa. South Africa was a bigger economy as compared to Zimbabwe. But now let's look at where Zimbabwe is presently. Financially, see, probably you can tell how is their growth as compared to what it was uh, uh, during, during the, 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 the sanctions. Because Naima said something very important, and we are always thinking as if sanctions are only targeted against the regime. And yet the fall 
of the Zimbabwean dollar was not only about the regime, but it was because of there was no money that was coming from outside. That is what made uh, that that, was, that is what caused the fall of the of the of the of the currency. Now let's look at ourselves and look at them. Uh, presently, you've got a lot of land that is now owned by, let me say, by the government, which is the the, the owners of, of 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 the land. What about us? We are still having problems now as compared to what we are hearing from, from, from uh, Peter Mulder and saying 40% belongs to whosoever is free from, 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 um, from the Bantus and stuff like that. We need to, to, to compare apples with apples because most of the time what, what you try to do, we try to, to compare apples with, with peers. Let's have uh, uh, African solutions for, okay. for African people because once you start going outside and say we need help from outside, most of the time, most of the time, most of those countries have got interest in Africa, and they will never just let go. All right. Thanks, Ms. Andile Victor in Cape Town. Good morning. Uh, hello. Hi, Victor. How are you? I'm well, thanks, Victor. Can you? Are you speaking on speaker? Yes, I'm going to speak. Yes. Are you on a speakerphone? Yes, I'm speaking. Yes, good. Yes, good. Can you get off the speakerphone? Because we're not going to hear you. No, I don't have a speaker yet. I don't have a radio. Okay. Well, can you speak up louder? Okay, okay, yeah, I can speak it out here. Mm. Okay, thanks for taking my call anyway. Yeah. Okay, that gentleman in the, uh, on your radio, I think uh, he's, I'll try to explain the exact thing what, uh, what happened in Zimbabwe. But uh, there are some differences. You see, in Zimbabwe, people were accused. You remember that, uh, otherwise, that time of uh, 2019, it, it, it might be too far. Just, uh, I just want to remind you about uh, what happened. Uh, in 2008, you know, most of the people they get killed, they, they were forced, forced to, to vote for uh, Zanzi. All of us will remember that. Mm. And they were really killed and forced and tortured. Nothing uh, was happened. Nothing was, 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 was done to Mugabe. And um, the people benefited the land reform in Zimbabwe. There are most of them from Zanzi. I think it's most of them they are from Zanzi. They benefited from the land they are reformed. And you know, Mugabe is the richest people here in Africa, and this our our boy is Mugabe. He is the richest of uh, the richest uh, uh, here in uh, maybe in the whole world. Remember that he's got a lot of money all of, uh, out of the country, mm-hmm. and he's got a lot of investment. But this country is suffering. People are suffering. Exactly. So we're not saying that uh, we're not saying that people we're not supposed to get the land, but mm-hmm. the way uh, uh, he did that is not I mean, uh, good uh, anything. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, Thanks, Victor. I'm going to have to let you go because your line is bad, but I uh, think you've made your points about, firstly, the, the election, people being forced to vote for ZANU-PF, that ZANU-PF are the only ones who benefited from land reform. But he makes the point, Admore, I think you were making earlier, that it's not about not implementing the land reform process, but it's the manner in which it was implemented. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> okay. Um um, just responding to your caller number one, I can't remember his N- name. Naim. <laughs> um, it is true that uh, when Robert Mugabe massacred Ndebele people in the 1980s, he came back to Britain, shook hands with the British Queen. When his hands were dripping with our blood, um, I mean, it, it, they went on again to give him a knighthood. That on its own basically explains the hypocrisy of the, of the West. People should not forget that when Robert Mugabe came into the scene, he was the Nelson Mandela of his time. He became the first African leader to address the United Nations in the presence of Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan. And he was described by world leaders, by the West, as the best thing to happen to African politics. At this point in time, when they were aggrandizing him like this, mm. Robert Mugabe was killing my people back home in Zimbabwe. Pregnant women were being bayoneted with, uh, 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 I mean, were being bayoneted to death. People being decapitated, having decapitated limbs. People being shot at close range. Uh, this is a true story which happened in Zimbabwe. All right. And let's, I accept mm. the hypocrisy of the world. Talking about mm. the economic, the economic sabotage, sabotage yeah, which, let's deal with that. Which um, um, uh, caller number one said. It is not true that um, there is... Apparently, there are over 300 British companies which are actively trading with Zimbabwe. And uh, 
again, he talks about the idea of um, high standards of being expected by the West in Zimbabwean politics. Let me tell you something about Zimbabwe is a special case as far as the British are concerned. Remember, well, I don't agree with it. There is a book which was published in the United Kingdom in 1972, probably mm-hmm. before me and you were born. The book describes Rhodesia as the only African country fit to bring up a white man's child. <laughs> yeah. I found the book to be very racist anyway. <laughs> but then... It, yeah. The, the thing is, if you go to Zimbabwe today, there is a place in Matopo outside the Bulawayo mm. called the Queensland. It's a beautiful. I'm explaining this for your callers, I mean, for your listeners to understand the, the complexity of uh, Zimbabwean British Western politics. There is a place called the Queensland yeah. outside Matopo. Now, when war veterans, during the height of land invasion, when war veterans tried to invade this place, Robert Mkabe sent the army to remove war veterans who had invaded, who invaded the Queen's land. This again shows that there are certain things that we as people, we don't know. Mm. That we as people, we don't know that there are insights that we don't know. And again, there is a debate in the United Kingdom, yeah. including Zimbabwe again that Robert Mugabe has a lot of respect of the British Queen. And the British Queen, although she doesn't participate in politics, she has never said anything negative about Robert Mugabe. You remember Prince Charles in Italy at some point when um, there was a lot of tension between Zimbabwe and uh, the United Kingdom under the watch of uh, Tony Blair. Mm. Prince Charles actually shook hands with Robert Mugabe, which became a very big tabloid story in the United Kingdom. This explains the complexity of uh, the talk. I hope I have given yeah. your caller some explanation on what really is transpiring there. Let's re- and looking into what uh, your what number Victor two was caller, that is Zandile, Zandile, yes. Zandile, who called from Johannesburg. Mm. He talks about Zimbabweans working in South Africa at all time in our history. Yeah. When I was growing up in Zimbabwe, I was born and bred in Zimbabwe myself, actually. Mm. Uh, there was a time, actually, when, uh, I mean, you will travel around in Popoma, where I used to live. You will never come across with a Zimbabwean who has been abroad. But at the moment, each and every house in Zimbabwe, either somebody is in South Africa, is in the United Kingdom, is in America, is in Australia. Well, of course, South Africa, I mean, is a continental powerhouse as far as African economy is concerned. And we expect a lot of high standards, a lot of uh, policing from the, I mean, fr- 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 from the South African government. Okay, so he you're expect, saying... Mm. I mean, he talks again about SADC to say he doesn't want outside interference. I'm sorry, again, if this is um, another way of demonstrating ignorance of how the world works. Can I ask your caller, uh, 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 I mean, uh, 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 a simple question. Why is it that the world economy is measured with the United States dollars? Who says that the South African economy should be measured by United States dollars? This is, to him, it should be a sign that the world is global. The, I mean, the, the world economy is intertwined with human rights. Okay. If you kill somebody in South Africa, if South African government sanctions killing of its people, it affects the, 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 the South African economy. All right. This is what we call much, uh, it's called uh, market logic, and it's called uh, the Washington Consensus in which the economy is intertwined. Isn't, so yeah. the talk, the rhetoric about outside um, interference is Robert Mugabe's rhetoric, which really he has managed successfully to inflict among Zimbabweans. All right, we're gonna, what we, let's do this. I'm going to take these last two calls because they've been holding on for a bit. Okay. And, there's yeah, a lot, okay. and there's a lot of SMSs as well. I'm going to get okay. into trouble if I don't read them. So let's just take Peter and KGM, and I'm going to ask them to be brief, and then I'll read SMSs, and then we'll wrap up. Okay. Peter. Hi. Hi, Siki. Good morning to you. Good morning. First thing is, I think Namib said everything. And then there's a gentleman who mentioned that Mugabe has got lots of money elsewhere. If he had money, the West and everybody would have brought it out into the open. Um, and I also believe that uh, people are obsessed uh, with, with Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe is going to get better. Zimbabwe will be the 
best country in the world in the next 20 years. <laughs> and I think we need to be able to, 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 to move on uh, um, and, 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 and find solutions. Um, uh, he also mentioned that South Africa should be able to police um, uh, the rest of Africa. South Africa should be able to police itself before it can police anyone else. Right. And I think the gentleman really is just like your, uh, what you call armchair critic. Um, he needs to be able to understand that Zimbabwe, in terms of uh, President Gabe winning the, the, the elections, it's almost a 50-50. You can't get an opposition coming at 49 or 50 with the incumbent and say, well, Right. Okay, the, Peter, the Peter, majority of young Peter. Zimbabweans are not registered to vote. All right, okay? Peter, so, I did say be brief, and I meant it. Um, and I'm um, KGM, I'm going to ask the same of you. Morning. Good morning, Mom Kavadele. Ah. Good morning to your guest. Mm. Good morning. Um, just, just concluding as the last caller, I think your, your guest is a typical example of beneficiaries of uh, the aberrated colonial uh, system. Uh, maybe he might not be aware. He he seems to be wanting us to believe what he says because he's Zimbabwean. I mean, I I, I probably uh, travel to Zimbabwe more than he does. He's talking from a comfort of his zone. I'm not by any chance suggesting that whatever that people claim, including him, that Robert Mugabe has done wrong, it's okay. But I think we need to compare an apple with an apple. He's talking about South Africa as a model. We have Andreas Katani and many other people have been killed after 94, after we are so-called independent. And to date, the families of those people will talk bitterly better than he does. Lastly, Mam Kavadeli, I think the solution not only for Zimbabwe but for the continent does not have to come from the West or anybody outside the continent. Us as Africans, we need to decide our own destiny and take it into our own relations of responsibility. Thanks, KGM. Um, Admiral Cam, I'm not going to have time to read the SMSs now. I'll read them after the okay. 10 o'clock news. Uh, I just want to get your final word and maybe um, in wrapping up and in what uh, KGM was pu- putting forward as a solution. What we need for Zimbabwe, basically, we need uh, what I can refer to as transformative remedies as opposed to affirmative rem- remedies. We need a holistic approach to the Zimbabwean economy, not a racial approach, not to to think about black and white, not to to think about gay, homosexuals, and so on. We need to decide upon socioeconomic inequalities, the best remedies, which I'm proposing, transformative remedies, which aim at correcting historical injustices by restructuring the underlying generative framework. Uh, basically, this is what I'm proposing as opposed to uh, um, affirmative remedies of social justice. And what do you think is going to happen now? To be honest, uh, the, it's unfortunate that most of your callers are South Africans. They need to have been Zimbabweans. The future is bleak. ZANU PF is in power. Perhaps there is a need for Zimbabweans to liberate ourselves from the liberators. I'm talking about the idea of all Zimbabweans coming out to vote for the opposition, to change what is happening at the moment. Our politics is poor, and our politics looks bleak. Well, the MDC is accused of being very weak itself. The MDC, to be honest with you, seems to be having a weak leader as well. Look at what uh, the Prime Minister, I mean the MDC leader, Moken Swangirai, He's been having problems, I mean, um, abusing women, let me put it bluntly like that. Mm, When you go there, you want to lead, you want to change Zimbabwe, you want to change a troubled nation like Zimbabwe, you need to be whiter than white. But unfortunately, the opposition leader really has disappointed us quite a lot. That's a huge allegation. Well, it's in the papers and uh, it's been there. It could be an allegation, but the truth is um, it's, it, it's plenty in Zimbabwean papers. It's there. Yeah, just because it's in the papers doesn't make it true, does it, Admiral? Um, well, I don't know. That is a little bit problematic <laughs> because uh, the thing is uh, the Prime Minister himself has not denied that. All right. We'll leave it there. Yeah. Thanks for your time this morning. Thank you very much. Thanks. That's Admiral Chuma, PhD researcher and international commentator on Southern African issues. I promise I'll read yeah, some of your SMSs after the news with Vabakshni Chetty.
Morning Talk with Siki Mgabadeli. Siki Mgabadeli. On SAFM 104-2107, just reading some of your SMSs sent through to 34701 on our previous uh, discussion. Someone says, Mugabe never won an election. We never benefited from land reform. Um, Excuse me. Mr. T says, stay strong. That's a long road. Big up to your exposés. Mugabe must change. Um, Ramutluatsi says, I love Mugabe very much because he's not a coward. He's not afraid of white people like our own leaders in South Africa. KB says Siki Mugabe didn't give people land. He saw the opportunity for him to remain in power. The idea of land reform started with the opposition party. And uh, someone says, your guest knows what he is talking about. And another one says, to me as a Zimbabwean, it's 32 years of black, brutal oppression and nepotism. And... uh, Audrey says, Siki, does your guest not fear for his life? And uh, Pete says, why is Zimbabwe importing food from white South Africans if they all have land? And uh, Pete says, if Zimbabwe is free from the West, why did they adopt a Western currency? And uh, another one says, Tabo in Palaburwa says, South Africa would be a better place with a president like Mugabe because I bet we wouldn't have people like Brett Murray and Afriforum within our borders. Sajini says, um, African leaders are all useless, corrupt and greedy. They think for themselves and their families. Matota says, if a black oppresses another, there is no noise. Black Zimbabweans are suffering more under Mugabe. Um, MM says, if Sanu PF was democratic, why would millions of citizens choose or be forced to look for better fortunes in neighboring countries. Uh, Sarah says, why are people fleeing Zimbabwe? Why don't you go and live there if you love Mugabe so much? And uh, Mary says, look at Ndata Mandela. He did what no other African leader did, forgave, and he unleashed naturally the power after realizing he'd done his part, freed South Africa. Gugu says, Zimbabwe's land reform and indigenization have gone very well, despite the doomsayers. Wake up, South Africa. Face these issues head on before it is too late. So those being some of your comments sent through 2347 2347 2347 2347 2347